That's it. All done. <clears throat> Except for one little thing. Yeah? You forgot to put on your wedding dress. <laughs> Margo, that's not fair. You can't expect a bride to remember everything. <laughs> Inger Stevens. The award-winning actress charmed audiences in the TV series The Farmer's Daughter and played opposite Clint Eastwood in the 1968 Western Hang 'em High. Stevens had killer looks, genuine talent, and a bright future in Hollywood. But on April 30th, 1970, the lifeless body of 35-year-old Inger Stevens was found face down on her kitchen floor. The official cause of death was suicide, but why would a rising young actress cash in her chips? True, if Hollywood had a mascot, it would be a sexy blonde starlet with a death wish, but the news of Inger's passing caught her friends and co-stars totally by surprise. I was just shocked and I'm stunned and saddened and bewildered. But I, in terms of anything other than just a suicide, no, that never entered my mind. Not everyone agrees that Stevens took her own life. Some say her death was an accident. Others insist the beloved actress was murdered was ingestion of uh, pills and alcohol. I think that whoever forced her to take them forced her to drink some wine or something to wash them down. On this episode of Mysteries and Scandals, we'll expose how Inger Stevens was dying to find true love. In someone's life who's had certain, you know, romantic entanglements that didn't work out, you can't help but feel that uh, for the frustration she may have felt. And we'll reveal how Inger's promising career could not shield her from personal desperation. There's always a bit of terror somewhere in the corner of her eye. I mean. And that, it was like she was encased in fear of something she couldn't figure out. I'm A.J. Benza. Join me as we grapple with the secrets of a forgotten Hollywood beauty, Ingrid Stevens. Thirty-five-year-old Inger Stevens was a successful film and television star when she died suddenly in 1970. The award-winning actress was apparently as fragile as she was beautiful. Oscar-winning actor Rod Steiger co-starred with Stevens in the 1958 film Cry Terror. If somebody said, give me a one-word impression of Inger Stevens, I would have said fatality. Something was going to happen, and it did. But in the days leading up to her death, no one suspected that Inger's life was about to take a terrible turn. Biographer William Patterson is the author of The Farmer's Daughter Remembered. She was up for a lead in a part of a TV series called Most Deadly Game. And uh, it was uh, produced by Aaron Spelling. Inger's personal assistant, Chris Bone, remembers her boss being optimistic about the future. She'd gone out and bought new clothes and, and was thrilled about doing it. And um, when I spoke to her, she had just gone out to dinner with Aaron Spelling and his wife and was quite excited about, about doing the show. Stevens was also excited about recent developments in her personal life. The 35-year-old actress was dating one of the hottest young actors in Hollywood, 34-year-old Burt Reynolds. On the evening before her death, Inger and Burt ate dinner together at her home in the Hollywood Hills. After Burt left, uh, which is, I'm guessing, around 6 or 7, something like that, later in the evening, she called Chris. The last time I talked to her was the night before she died. She asked me if I could come over, and I couldn't. She wasn't happy that night, and she had had a couple of glasses of wine and said, well, don't worry about it. I'll take sleeping pill, and you know, see you in the morning. But in the morning, Inger Stevens was dead. A friend arrived at Inger's home to find Stevens unconscious on the kitchen floor. Paramedics were called immediately, but the beautiful young actress died en route to the hospital. I was devastated. I was just totally devastated. And then, you know, my first reaction was guilt because I didn't go that night. After the police came the next morning, and her friends were in the house, and they found the phone that was normally in the living room was not there. Uh, in the bedroom, the carpet had been pulled back, and Bert's pictures were under the carpet like she didn't want someone to see them. And she had gotten the ingredients of her favorite sandwich out. And on the kitchen counter, there was uh, a vial which is an asthma pill, and the press said that's what killed her. Neither she nor her friends had asthma. For those who knew Stevens, her sudden death came as a shock. TV's Columbo, actor Peter Falk. I was stunned, stunned. I couldn't believe it. I had no, no intimation, none. 
Harry Flynn worked as a publicist for The Farmer's Daughter, the 1960s television show that starred Inger Stevens. A girl has her own series. That's success. The idea of achieving it and reaching some kind of a plateau uh, and then ending it all doesn't seem an answer that Inger would uh, have come up with. Never thought she committed suicide, and I'll tell you why. Her makeup would have been perfect. She would have been in the, you know, prettiest negligee she owned. And she was in a robe and scruffy slippers, from what I understand, and there's no way. And I just figured that it was the combination of the couple of glasses of wine she told me she'd had and, and the sleeping pills. Police said that uh, she, it was probably accidental that she forgot she took a pill and took another one. But in the autopsy, uh, there were at least 25 to 50 pills in her when they opened her up. So did Inger ingest a month's worth of sedatives in one night by mistake? I'm talking to a coroner. Uh, I was informed that a lot of people will take pills if they're forced to. I think someone forced them down her. Uh, by the way, there's some abrasions on her arm, too. And no one knows where they came from. But who'd want to kill Inger Stevens? When we come back, we'll investigate the theories surrounding Inger's suspicious death. Was Stevens murdered, or was her death the result of one too many broken hearts? In 1970, film and television star Inger Stevens died from an overdose of barbiturates. Inger's death came as a shock to many people who knew her, especially since the 35-year-old seemed to have everything to live for. Stevens was talented, beautiful, successful, and had come a long way from the days of her troubled youth. Or had she? Inger was born in Stockholm, Sweden in 1934. Uh, the date was October 18th. Her father was a school teacher, and uh, her mother ran off when she was very young. Kurt Crivello is the author of Fallen Angels. Her father remarried and moved to the United States and left Inger and her younger brother uh, with relatives. In 1944, 10 year old Inger and her brother Ola traveled by ship across the Atlantic Ocean. Inger's father and his new wife were supposed to pick up the children at a shipyard in New Orleans. Her dad and stepmother were not there to meet them, so uh, she was greeted by the Salvation Army who uh, put her on a train to uh, New York City. They managed to get the kids up to New York City and then on to Massachusetts where the father was having a vacation. He didn't even come down to pick up the kids. She was searching for love that she honestly never got from her father. Her father rejected her and, and she admits this and, and knew that. Ingram may have known how much emotional baggage she was carrying, but that didn't make her load any lighter. Dr. Chris Mohandi is a police psychologist. So she brings to the table um, a history of abandonment, rejection, and instability in her childhood with the moves and with um, parents leaving and coming and going, those kinds of issues. In 1948, Inger's father moved the family from the island of Manhattan to Manhattan, Kansas. 14-year-old Inger attended junior high school where she developed an interest in theater. Inger wanted to be a star. 19-year-old Inger made her way back to New York City in the fall of 1953. The aspiring actress starred in several TV commercials. In February of 1956, Inger was in her first Broadway play called Debut. And uh, she had married her agent, Tony Soglio. And uh, they weren't getting along. And he was somewhat, I guess, abusive towards her. Uh, so they were separated, but he still acted as her agent. They were really married only six months. They lived together but the divorce didn't occur uh, for another three years after that. And he arranged for her uh, to have a testing contract at 20th Century Fox. So Fox brought her out to Hollywood. At age 22, Inger Stevens quickly became a hot commodity in Tinseltown. She was funny and she was beautiful and she was a hell of an actress. And that was my first impression and that, that never changed. This is a lady from Scandinavia who came over here and started to have a uh, career rather successfully uh, in Hollywood. And uh, obviously her personal problems and God knows what, uh, she didn't have the strength for it. Strength is the one thing you gotta have in Hollywood. Well, strength and maybe an expense account. Ingrid Stevens would have paid any price to find peace of mind. Straight ahead, what roles did Bing Crosby, Dean Martin, and Anthony Quinn play in Stevens' real-life tragic love story? And did Inger's desperate search for Mr. Wright have fatal consequences? 
In 1956, at age 22, Hollywood newcomer Inger Stevens claimed her place among the giants of the movie business. Inger's first film role cast her opposite the legendary Bing Crosby in the 1957 flick Man on Fire. And man oh man did sparks fly between Inger Stevens and a leading man. The young actress thought 53-year-old Bing was hot stuff. They were very much in love, or she thought they were, and uh, she heard on the radio that he had married uh, Catherine Grant that day. She later told people the reason that they didn't marry was because she wasn't Catholic. Crosby wasn't the only famous name in Inger's little black book. In the late 1950s, Stevens was linked romantically to several celebrity studs. On her third film, The Buccaneer, is when she met her, her next big love, Anthony Quinn. That lasted about a year. But rumors persist that the breakup with Quinn bothered 24-year-old Inger tremendously. Some say that, that her well-publicized suicide attempt uh, on New Year's Eve 1959 was over her breakup with Anthony Quinn. Others contend that Inger became deeply depressed on the set of the 1958 film The World, The Flesh, and The Devil. While making the picture, Steven supposedly fell in love with yet another co-star, actor Harry Belafonte. It didn't work out, and she just got really depressed about it. She just decided that life wasn't worth living. She did take some pills, and she almost died. Later, after she recovered, she said it's the dumbest thing she'd ever done in her life. And she said, now I have a, a desire to live and really enjoy life. Feeling renewed, Inger took a break from movie making and spent the next two years starring on the small screen. Stevens made guest appearances on more than a dozen TV shows, including Bonanza and The Twilight Zone. And in the fall of 1961, 27-year-old Inger took on the role of blushing bride once again. She married Ike Jones. He was uh, working for Nat King Cole at the time. And they got married in Tijuana. It wasn't accepted in those days for um, a black man and a white woman to be married. And she introduced him to me and seemed to be very proud of the relationship. I'm sure some people said, hey, don't do that. It might hurt your career. Though Inga's friends and colleagues knew about Ike, the couple kept their marriage a secret from the public. She continued working in television. In 1962, Inger co-starred with actor Peter Falk on The Dick Powell Show, a dramatic anthology series. Both Stevens and Falk were nominated for Emmy Awards for their performance in the one-hour episode, The Price of Tomatoes. I remember The Price of Tomatoes as being very, very happy. And I remember that my first impression of Inger, when I, when I first met her, I instantly liked her. In the early 60s, she got the part of The Farmer's Daughter, which was a TV series. And that ran uh, for three years, and they did 101 shows. She was, uh, you know, the maid or the uh, governess or whatever she played for William Wyndham, who was the congressman. And they ultimately married in one of the shows, which had one of the highest ratings of any show. In the spring of 64, 29-year-old Stevens won a Golden Globe for her role in The Farmer's Daughter. But Inger's two-and-a-half-year marriage to Ike Jones wasn't winning any prizes. He was a nice-looking man and could be very charming, but he could also drink a lot, and they had many a fight. It just was a thing that wasn't going to work out. I always had the feeling this woman would get involved with somebody who would kind of be uh, sadistic and, and kind of tell her she was nothing, 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 until one day she thought she was nothing. She didn't like herself for some reason. I don't know what it was, because she certainly was a nice person. I saw her in love, really in love once, and that was Dean Martin. It went on for quite a while, and then he ended it. And she was devastated. She cried and cried and, and did when they, they broke up. If Inger was an emotional wreck, she certainly pulled herself together in front of the cameras. By early 1970, 35-year-old Inger was a TV celebrity with 15 films to her credit. Inger also had a new boyfriend, actor Burt Reynolds. You know, once we started, there wouldn't be any turning back. I know that. She met Bert on her last movie. It was a TV movie called Run, Simon, Run. And the night she died, uh, he was there at her house, and she cooked him dinner. After Bert left, Inger asked her assistant, Chris Bone, to come over. Chris couldn't get to Inger's until the next morning. By then, Chris had heard on the radio that Inger Stevens was dead. I drove up to the house, got the baby in the car, and I saw the police. All these people were there, and I just stopped and turned around and went home. Inger Stevens wasn't the first, and unfortunately, she won't be the last celebrity to die of a drug overdose. But was Inger's death self-inflicted or merely staged to look that way?
On April 30th, 1970, film and TV star Inger Stevens was dead of a barbiturate overdose at the age of 35. The autopsy stated Inger's death was a suicide. Now, since Stevens attempted to offer herself 10 years earlier, she must have tried again, this time succeeding. At least that was the coroner's theory. She did not leave a suicide note, and uh, she also didn't leave a will. Uh, so that's why so many people were shocked at the time of her death. I mean, she was doing so well, her, her, her career was going well. Basically, there are three possibilities in this situation. Number one, accident. Hypothesis two is that it was a homicide and the person staged the crime to throw the trail off of the likely suspect. And hypothesis three, which is what the coroner ruled, is that it was, in fact, a suicide. A person that was despondent and wanted to take their own life. Rod Steiger witnessed Inger's suicidal tendencies when they co-starred in the 1958 movie Cry Terror. While filming a scene in a New York City subway, Steiger and Stevens were overwhelmed by carbon monoxide fumes. She goes past the camera, I go past the camera, and when we do, she collapses, and I caught her. I'm standing there with the leading lady in my arms, and there's about four ambulances, two paramedics, the police and everything. The generator was pumping carbon monoxide. And we get up, and we get into the hospital, and they give me the mask to purify the, my uh, oxygen. And they come in and say, Mr. Steiger, we don't know what to do. I said, what's the matter? She says, she won't breathe. She won't take it. She wants to die. And uh, she came out of it, but you'd have to be an idiot not to know that uh, this lady was not too happy with the false poetry of living. There was a delicacy about her. And there was, yes, there was something fragile about her, but she wasn't somebody that when you met them said, gee, you got to tread very carefully here or, or she'll break. Perhaps Inger's overdose was accidental. At the time of her death, Inger's blood alcohol level was a 0.17, more than twice the legal limit. Stevens may not have realized how many downers she was downing. Forensic pathologist Dr. David Posey. And the anxiety of and the frustration of whatever is bothering her kind of wells up and says, oh, well, I didn't go to sleep. And obviously, that didn't work, so I'll pop a few more pills, and I can see throw four more down, another drink of, of alcohol, and a few more minutes goes by, and again, repeats this thing. So that, I think that's a real key there. Up until her tragic death, Inger Stevens seemed genuinely happy. She was excited about her new romance with Burt Reynolds, and she was up for the lead for a new TV series. Doesn't sound like a recipe for depression. Stevens' biographer, William Patterson, doesn't believe Inger was suicidal. He also doesn't buy that Stevens would overdose accidentally. In the autopsy, uh, there were at least 25 to 50 pills in her when they opened her up. And uh, uh, a person just doesn't forget and take that many. Also on the bedroom floor, there were a bunch of reds, which was uh, a pill that you take to go to sleep, you know. And uh, she did not take reds. If she wanted something to sleep with, she'd take a pill that's known as a rainbow. And uh, there were no rainbows found in the house. You've got medication that she uh, supposedly, according to friends, is not normally taking. But is that the truth? We don't really know. Uh, maybe she does take a few pills here and there just to help her sleep if she's anxiety ridden or if she's upset with somebody. Patterson believes somebody coerced Inger to swallow a lethal dose of sedatives. I think there was someone that did come to the house later that night. And they're there during the period that the pills would have been ingested. I think that whoever forced her to take them, forced her to drink some wine or something to wash them down. Patterson has his suspicions about who the killer might be, but for legal reasons, he ain't talking. But Patterson will say who didn't do it. And Bert had nothing to do with her death, though. And the FBI didn't do it. They just, they just killed Marilyn, but they didn't kill her. Whoops, wrong episode. I think homicide is really, I uh, would be low on my list of, of, of things to think of. The reason it would be low on my list is because there seems to be no motive. There's no evidence at the scene that there is any foul play. There's no forced entry. There's no force of any kind. A more likely scenario is that Inger took the lethal combination of booze and pills voluntarily. Whether the 35-year-old actress intended to end her life, we'll never really know. This is a quote by Inger. When I lie down at the end of the road, I'll want to have left something behind, even if it is just having helped one other person. She helped more than one other person. She helped quite a few people. She helped me a lot. Nearly 30 years after her death, Inger Stevens is remembered fondly. This is uh, 
a very beautiful crippled bird that was still trying to take off. And you can't do it with one wing. It's like somebody who was told life was a poem and it ain't. She was looking for the poem all the time. There was this delicate quality. Even her, her beauty was, it wasn't a boom, 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 here I am. It was, uh, she was beautiful, but it was laid back. I was impressed with her as a human being. And she was everything you would want in a friend. She was loyal. She was uh, so concerned about your happiness and your well-being. And um, I still miss her. 30 years later, I miss her. There is no star for Inger Stevens on this boulevard of broken dreams. Yet in so many ways, Inger's story of stardom and tragedy is Hollywood's most consistent theme. I'm A.J. Benza. Join me the next time we take a stroll down the flip side of the Walk of Fame. <laughs>